So next we have um, Mike Barnett, who can talk to us about sea turtles and artificial reefs. Thank you. Can use this? Okay, great. Thanks, good afternoon. How are you guys doing? Uh, I want to apologize in advance. Uh, it seems I probably uh, have probably the most least appetizing presentation right before lunch. Uh, so I'm going to get those apologies out of the way. also want to thank several of you in the room. see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, some of you I haven't seen for years or even decades. But uh, some of you, a couple of years ago, I started soliciting information uh, on potential interactions of sea turtles on artificial reefs. And some of you were very generous in buying your observations and information. So thank you for that. So my talk today is basically utilizing, oh, okay, sure. You right here, okay? Uh, it's, it talks about considerations for material use and site planning uh, when looking at artificial reefs. While typically you guys are designing artificial reefs for fish species or fishermen, uh, as we know, sea turtles also utilize artificial reefs. Uh, and, and these are endangered species, either listed as threatened or endangered. We have six species under the Endangered Species Act. So uh, we have three listed as endangered. We have leatherback kemps and hawksbill. And we also have three listed as threatened, the loggerhead, green, and olive ridley, which the last uh, we typically don't see here of Florida. Nonetheless, uh, as part of my job, I have to look at interactions, uh, man-made, whether it's uh, through some of these activities, whether it be artificial reefs or fishing activities or dredging, uh, any kind of federal action that is authorized or funded, we have to evaluate and determine the effects on these protected species. Uh, I've underlined a loggerhead here because during this synthesis uh, and evaluation of these impacts on uh, sea turtles, it seems like loggerhead are the front runner for utilizing artificial reefs and also having the most uh, potential uh, negative impacts on the species. So as I mentioned on the Endangered Species Act, uh, the term take, that's a general term we utilize uh, under the Endangered Species Act, but that definitely means uh, whether harass, harm, pursue, hunt, uh, collect, or engage in any of these activities. So if you go out and uh, basically shoot a sea turtle, that's illegal, or inadvertently, that's also considered take and is illegal unless it's previously authorized under consultation through the Endangered Species Act. As I mentioned, yeah, it's unlawful for any person subject to the jurisdiction of the United States to take any such species or uh, on the high seas or in the United States. And this also includes whether it's intentional or unintentional. Uh, so whether you're doing scientific research or it's bycatch in a fishery. And this is, I guess, a lot of these uh, activities I'll be mentioning or interactions I'll be mentioning are unintentional or incidental uh, when, in regards to sea turtles and artificial reefs. So as I mentioned, as part of my job, we have to evaluate uh, activities that are either authorized or funded by the federal government. We do this in coordination with our federal partners, the Army Corps of Engineers. So for you guys that are planners, managers, or uh, contractors, uh, wanting to put artificial reefs out, as you know, you have to get a permit through the Army Corps of Engineers uh, for a construction permit, and they consult with us to determine the effects of those actions and ways potentially to minimize any negative impacts. And as obviously many of you know, there's quite a few artificial reefs and shipwrecks around the state of Florida. Uh, this gives you an example, basically all around the entire coastline and interior waters as well, we have material. Uh, we also have quite a few natural shipwrecks, which I've also incorporated into this uh, because it helps to serve as a proxy for how artificial reefs deployed, say, last year might uh, basically act 30 or 40 years down the road. So it's a good predictor of how it may uh, function due to several decades of fishing activity, fishing line accumulation, et cetera. But this, this is obviously mis very misleading to see this because of the, the size of the icons. What Keith was talking about earlier, it's it's not the number of artificial reefs or wrecks out there, but the footprint, uh, the square footage or area that these artificial reefs potentially produce uh, over natural habitat. And this is what, as divers, if you're out there, you see that sea turtles do utilize artificial reefs much the same way they use natural reefs for, uh, for basically protection shelter when they're, they're sleeping, which they sleep quite a bit, uh, or also for foraging. 
So the artificial reefs do provide beneficial impacts, uh, beneficial effects to sea turtles. Unfortunately, as you guys know, uh, one of the old adages is if you build it, they will come. Uh, it's not only true for, for fish species and sea turtles, but also for fishermen, and that's where the rub comes in. So the primary considerations when we're talking about artificial reefs and sea turtles, there's three of them. Uh, first one is entrapment, then we have entanglement, and then we also have predation. So these are the three aspects that we've kind of narrowed down and we're looking at to, to how to uh, address these and minimize these potential effects. So I'll, I'll go through these. The first one is entrapment. Uh, obviously it's the most obvious. Uh, these, these sea turtles, if you're a diver or if you've watched Finding Nemo, you know sea turtles aren't the brightest animals out there. Uh, they're not problem solvers. And as we know, sea turtles like to, to hunker down under stuff uh, when they're sleeping because they want to float away and also protects their head from predators. Un unfortunately, sometimes they kind of burrow up under, let's say, a module, an artificial reef module that has an open bottom. It's uh, through natural erosion or what have you, it's able to slip underneath there. And then when it wakes up, it doesn't know the way back out. Again, it, these are not terribly bright animals. But as you can see here, this is a tetrahedron, I believe. And this is typically what we see uh, as evidence uh, because the natural rate of decay is relatively quick. Uh, we normally see skeletons, uh, skeletalized bones of sea turtles. And here we have on the interior, basically the remains of the sea turtle uh, that uh, most likely got inside to the interior of this uh, module and drowned and perished. And then the skeleton disarticulated and is partially buried. You know, there's a couple of views of that. And these are not always extremely obvious as well uh, because they do sand over. There's just natural uh, processes at work. Let's see if I can play this. This is an example of, uh, this was relatively recent, I think it was last year. This is a artificial reef module. Uh, this is uh, a module that's no longer utilized. Uh, it's an obsolete module. But you can see part of the metal bars over time deteriorated and allowed access to the interior. And we have this loggerhead, unfortunate loggerhead, who recently perished. This is a relatively fresh carcass. Uh, again, we have basically less than a week when these guys drown, obviously natural decomposition. And depending on water temperature and predation, um, about a week passes and these things start to break down relatively quickly. This gives you an idea, once it gets into this interior space, that uh, odds are the turtle will not find its way back out. And again, this is relatively uh, isolated to modules that, uh, that have these open bottoms or there's access to the interior. And these in recent years have been addressed. I think we've um, worked quite a bit with FWC and, and some artificial reef uh, contractors and designs. So these, we're not putting new designs out, thankfully. Uh, and we're, we're addressing these kind of concerns for sea turtles to try to avoid future uh, instances of this. Again, potential solutions, as I alluded to. Uh, one of the ones that uh, up there doing in the panhandle is they're just lopping the top off these modules. Again, sea turtles are air breathing animals. So when it gets under something like that, uh, and then it wakes up and realizes it has to go breathe, it's gonna swim up. Uh, it's not gonna go back down and back out uh, of a, uh, an object or material. So having an open top allows that unfettered access to the surface and allows the sea turtle to escape and continue its uh, life. And so that's one aspect of probably the simplest aspect to, to eliminate these kind of issues because uh, we, as we know, you want those open bottoms. So for stacking, for deployment, it makes uh, logistics uh, makes it a lot easier. So we understand that. That's a, a very good solution that we've worked with FWC and contractors to sort of resolve. Now entanglement. This is uh, an issue that is not unique to our fisheries. reefs. This is a marine police marine debris and marine pollution issue. It's a global issue. It's not Florida, it's not our fisheries, as many of you know. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, while fish show up in our fisheries, so do fishermen. And that's why we start seeing monofilament, anchor lines, and all the material. And this is the, the, the aspect of our fisheries. Uh, as as an avid diver, uh, I started, I've seen quite a few of these kind of examples and start seeing more and more recent years. And I've dived kind of all over the state and, and areas kind of off the track that aren't really uh, popular with, uh, let's say, visiting a tourist divers. And I'm, I started seeing this, and I was just trying to figure out how often this happened. And these two turtles are two turtles that I found on the exact same reef on the exact same day. 
And that was kind of the, the, the turning point for me was how often does this happen? If I see two turtles, freshly dead turtles on the same wreck on the same day, and we know there's thousands of objects out there, material, this could potentially be an issue. And again, when we look at other activities, we look at fisheries. Some of the fisheries we manage, we expect maybe, we've estimated maybe one or two sea turtle takes a year, over two or three years. And here we have something that is wider ranging and obviously uh, more pervasive. So to me, it started warranting further scrutiny. And again, you can see this is the monothelone wrapped around it uh, and pinned it, to, basically anchors it to the bottom. This is a, uh, basically a, a turtle that was uh, other kind of line. This is off a wreck off of uh, Brevard County. But again, it's a small turtle that uh, was anchored to the bottom. And this is an interesting case. This is a large loggerhead. This is uh, the remains of a World War II fighter aircraft. And we're, when I'm talking about the remains of a fighter aircraft, it's not an intact aircraft at all. This is bits of scrap metal on the bottom. It's been down for 60 years. And all it was, you can see that one strand of anchor line wrapped around it, wrapped around its neck, and anchored it to the bottom. And that's all it takes. So I, unfortunately, it doesn't have to be decades of just oodles of unmonofilament. It can be just one, unfortunately, one piece of line that wraps around the turtle uh, and pins at the bottom. And also interestingly about this, we, we do this wreck uh, basically, I think two weeks after this photo was taken and the turtle was gone. So again, this, the, the whole concept of absence of ev evidence of absence, whatever that adage is, uh, it basically says that, you know, these turtles, they break down, they, you have currents, you have predation, and the carcass says the evidence disappears. Uh, so just because you dive a site that has a lot of monofilament, you're not seeing sea turtles, potentially might not have been any entangled sea turtles, but conversely, there might have been uh, an interaction. And this is another example under a wreck. You can see skeletalized remains, but then right up here on the top, you can see there's an anchor line there, and the, the skeletalized bone is still hanging in that loop of line that probably anchored it to the wreck and caused it to drown. So sometimes the evidence isn't as obvious as this, uh, but under the Endangered Species Act, we have to be risk averse and err on the side of conservation. So that's, if people are, are concerned about why are we looking at this when we don't have thousands of potential sea turtles documented, it doesn't take a thousand or more or less uh, to basically cause concern. And we've seen this with anchor lines, monofilament, trawl nets. Uh, I believe there was a case of a, a cast net, uh, an inshore reef in Southwest Florida that our fish reef manager told us about. So it's multiple types of gear. So this is, again, broadly classified as marine debris, uh, but it does result in citral mortality uh, when associated with our fish and reefs. And this is an interesting site. It, a lot of times when we're doing consultations, one of the activities for mitigation is well, we'll do a periodic monofilament cleaning of wrecks. And that definitely is helpful. Uh, but again, if you clean something and then next week there's more monofilament, uh, there potentially is a source for an interaction. And then we also have our fisheries in deeper water, beyond 130 feet of water where recreational divers don't go. You're not gonna have the opportunity to do a, a large scale cleanup. And this is a wreck, this is the Bill Boyd off Fort Lauderdale. And you can see there's so much monofilament on there that it basically, there's been a, a section of railing that's been pulled off, it's suspended mid-water uh, by all, a, a, quite a bit of monofilament. So again, this uh, shows you how much monofilament can accumulate over time, uh, which presents a risk to sea turtles and other marine life. This will give you a little video of, of the mechanisms of play here. So this is a, a, a wreck that I was diving. Came across a turtle, which it, at first appearance, it seems like it's the turtle resting there on the bottom. Uh, this is obviously a very freshly uh, dead loggerhead sea turtle. This has probably been down less than 12, hour, 12 hours because I turned it over, bubbles escaped from its, uh, from its mouth. And there you see, you see all, all that monofilament, as we know, those balls up on wrecks. And it seemed like it wrapped around the neck, but then it turned out to be only one piece of monofilament uh, attached to ground tackle that wrapped around uh, the base of some metal there that uh, anchored to the bottom. And unfortunately, this, this uh, turtle uh, lost his life because of that. So 
that's something to keep in mind as well when designing these, these uh, artificial reefs and how we can mitigate uh, uh, impacts through fishing, which we know is going to come when deploying artificial reefs. And as I mentioned before, a lot of times we don't have that proof positive. We don't have these freshly dead turtles anchored up. We see this. And it's quite common. I mean, if you actually look at some of these wrecks in some places more than others, uh, you do see skeletalized bones. Does that mean it was entangled? Does that mean it was entrapped? Not necessarily, but it is a cause of concern. We see it so much. In fact, there's some commercial fishermen that I've talked to, commercial spear fishermen that down the Florida Keys, that have been diving for 30, 40 years, and they told me on some wrecks, it's more often not that they see turtle bones on these wrecks. So it is a cause of concern, what's causing that? Potentially some of these could be natural mortality. We know predation could be a possibility. We had one example of a sea turtle that, on an artificial reef that had a shark bite in it. So obviously it probably died and then the current dragged it into the wreck and it caught it there. But you know, in that case, we actually had that information, that evidence to determine what the cause of death for that. But odds are, most time we see this. So the last one is predation. And this is something that maybe you haven't really thought about directly because it is kind of a, a different uh, concept to think about. So sea turtles, when they reproduce, they nest on the beach, and they lay their eggs on the beach, and then uh, after a period of time, these hatchlings emerge from the sand and make a beeline for the ocean. We know that lighting is an issue and stuff, but we also know that potentially uh, predation. This is a high period of, of mortality for these guys, potentially. Uh, and looking at the available information out there, there's been quite a few studies looking at uh, habitat types off the beaches and such. And when you have a homogenous sand bottom, let's say the Panhandle of Florida, and it's largely sand, you, know, you have your natural predators that forge in those kind of areas, but then you add structure. Now you're introducing more different predators that normally wouldn't be there. And if, so there's consideration about putting these right off nesting beaches. You put a bunch of artificial reefs that add barracuda and other predatory fish that when these sea turtles are emerging off the beach, they have to run the gauntlet now, there's gonna be a higher chance of predation. So, Again, the behavior, this, this swimming frenzy after they, they uh, hatch, basically it's about a thousand yards. Looking at the information, they've actually tagged these little baby sea turtles to see how far they do the swimming frenzy before they get out past the, the danger zone. And it's about a thousand feet or so. Uh, interestingly enough, that they also looked at studies where there's natural habitat, like off the coast here, you have natural reef where you already have that predatory complex. And they noticed if you, Basically, it basically implies that if you add an artificial reefs out there that already have these predatory fish, there's not going to be any significant uptake in predation. They already have that to deal with. But again, it's when you dramatically change the habitat areas, all these nesting beaches, that problems could uh, present. So that, that's the predation aspect uh, of this talk. Now again, I've just time to tried to summarize a lot of these issues. We did a paper, again, I mentioned about a couple years ago when I started asking for information. Uh, it documents all the instances of, of reported uh, mortality events. Uh, I think we have over 40 alone just for uh, entanglement, which is it's a pretty high number, considering this is opportunistic. A lot of times people see these kind of events, they don't know who to report it to. Uh, we've actually had uh, instances where uh, I think there's two. I think Larry Wood, who's a sea turtle biologist off here at Palm Beach, has see, found two sea turtles that were entangled, but they're still alive. They got there at time, and he basically said that one was on Amaryllis and one was on, I think, a natural reef. So we know this happens on natural reef as well. But they showed up, and they were able to free the turtle uh, before it drowned. So that is extremely rare occurrence when you have something like that. So again, it, again, it makes you think about how large of an issue this might be. Uh, Potentially, it could be. Uh, it's uh, wor worthy of further investigation, which this is an emerging kind of issue. Uh, we've worked with Army Corps of Engineers. There's a lot of sea turtle biologists now looking into this uh, in a ways to potentially minimize this. Because again, uh, we know our fish reefs, we want to you know, work and try to minimize our footprint uh, out there. So 
Uh, this could potentially helpfully, hopefully be useful information when designing and, and uh, planning for our fishery sites in the future. And with that, I tried to go through this as quick as possible because I know you guys are probably hungry. If you have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Any questions from Mike?
Please come see your honor as your global secret agent. She is much closer than I am um, in the bar area. And so she'll be moderating this afternoon session. Thanks, Molly. I hope everyone had a delicious and satisfying lunch. I know I felt pretty good right this morning. Please don't forget there is coffee and tea back there. <laughs> Next up, I would like to present Peter McDonald from Race Smart, who is going to be presenting on Race Smart Guides, creating 3D dive maps of the artificial news here in Southeast Florida. Thanks, Anna. Hi everyone, um, Pete McDougal from ReSmart. Uh, some of you uh, may be already familiar with us, uh, others I'm sure are not. Um, we are a, a Montreal-based organization. Um, I'm here in Florida and I'm just gonna basically walk you through a little bit who we are, what we do, um, how we do it, and, and a little bit about how um, we've already been interacting with some of the artificial uh, reefs here in Southeast Florida and, and some of our plans going forward. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Reef Smart Guides, uh, we're based in Montreal, Canada. Um, the running joke is this is our Christmas party. There's not a lot of great diving up there uh, for those who are more tropically inclined. Um, and so we spend a lot more of our time down here in the Caribbean. Um, there's three of us who are the founders, myself, uh, my colleagues Ian Popple and Otto Wagner. Um, Ian and I have a, a marine ecology background, both have our masters in, in coral reef ecology, um, and we really um, have approached our effort currently with uh, keeping science in, in close to our, uh, our chests. We really want science and, and uh, the ecology of coral reefs to inform a lot of the things that we do, uh, which I'm going to be circling back to a little bit later. Uh, Otto is the, the creative mind behind um, our effort. He's a lot of what brings the science and actually turns it into the, uh, the art that you'll see. Um, so what, what, what do we do? Um, we create uh, three-dimensional um, 3D maps of reefs. They're, they're photorealistic um, uh, images of, of these reefs. They um, uh, wrecks. Um, are any, uh, really any artificial object that is uh, under the water. We can, we can map, we can render, um, and we can provide in a, in a photorealistic manner. Um, the models um, are, can be used, the models that we create for these, these maps can be used in a variety of, of um, products and materials. I have, I have some on the table with me. Um, I'm welcome to uh, look through them if you want, but I'll be showing some images and examples um, during the presentation. Um, they, they include 2D things such as waterproof cards you can take down with you on the dive, um, uh, images used in a guide, guide book, um, but also 3D models that are interactive, not necessarily in a VR capacity, but something that can be fully manipulated, um, the environment can be zoomed in and out of, um, as well as physical models and, and you know, large posters and what have you. Um, so here's a little bit about the waterproof dive and snorkel cards. These are waterproof cards, about eight and a half by five and a half. Um, they are fully immersible. Um, you can even write on them with wax crayons if you want, uh, take notes. Um, then we can also take these images and blow them up to large poster uh, for, for divers and dive masters. We can do briefing chart maps. Um, we can also wrap a whole building. Basically, the images, the models that we've created, we can render them at whatever uh, DPI, at whatever resolution um, is, is best suited for the application that we do. Um, and so there are a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of potential applications from a corporate point of view, but there's also a lot of potential applications from an educational and outreach point of view. Um, and that's where I'm gonna be trying to target some of the conversation later on in the presentation. We also do printed guidebooks. Uh, we currently have Barbados uh, in print and available. Um, we are wrapping up a guidebook for Broward County as we speak. Um, we're basically, we've got all the content together and we're going through our, our fact checking and copy editing. Um, we are hoping to line something up to do another guidebook for uh, Palm Beach County. Um, we are headed back to Bonaire this summer to do a guidebook for that. Um, and, and that's just 2018, we're trying to slot in um, so basically we've reinvented or we are looking to reinvent what has been a fairly scattered and hit or miss uh, market to date on the diving guidebook. 
um, everywhere from uh, hand-drawn maps that are on a spiral-bound Xerox thing that kind of gets passed between from hand to hand, all the way to you know some lonely planets which maybe just excerpted some of their travel guides, anything that mentioned swimming or snorkeling, and they put that into a book and tried to sell that. So we're trying to approach it from the point of view of divers um, and snorkelers, what information they want, um, and and combined with our mapping uh, techniques to really provide um, information that will help um, enhance the in-water experience for divers and snorkelers. Um, we also have eBooks. Um, so this is an example of what it looks like, our little 3D model. Um, we have it on our website. There's a, there's a tab on our website. It's kind of more of a prototype example on our website. Um, there hasn't been a lot of demand for this as a standalone product, but we see this as being something that um, can really be used in a uh, in um, educational and outreach sense um, because it's a it's a very effective way at um, allowing people to experience what the underwater is without obviously getting underwater and and seeing as how there's a huge percentage of the public who never bothers to don a mask and go underwater um, this can help a lot of uh, organizations get the word out to uh, to a broader range um, why we do what we do. Um, so, as I mentioned, Ian and I, we have a background in, in marine science. Um, we're, we're passionate about conservation efforts, we're passionate about marine education, we're passionate about um, essentially helping the general public understand better what's going on under the surface of the water, because in order to want to protect it, they have to understand it. Um, and so, the way we figured out that we can contribute to that is through um, better informing and, and promoting diving and helping pro promote diving and, and snorkeling in locations where it's already a key industry, um, but also to help development in areas where um, it maybe hasn't taken off quite yet in a sustainable way, recognizing that um, there is an impact on reefs to have extensive diving and having hordes of tourists there. So we're looking to um, educate and improve the in-water experience through our maps, through the education components of the maps, um, through the information that we provide in our guidebooks. Um, it's all in a sense, you know, most of you will be familiar with the equivalent of, of um, going on a hike. And, and if you go on a hike, you've got guidebooks to, to help you choose which one you wanna go on, which hike best suits, what your goals are for that trip. Um, there isn't really, this is the equivalent for a dive. You, you basically show up at a dive shop and if they've got a map, you can say, well, what's good? What are you guys doing? Um, so, so we're trying to improve the in-water experience for divers because we figure that will enhance um, engagement and it will, um, it will, in essence, then offer a venue to better educate um, the diving and snorkeling public. Um, it also improves safety. If you have a better sense of what the condition of the wreck is, um, where the wreck orientation is, um, even in bad visibility, you'll be able to navigate the wreck much better if you have something more than a hand-drawn map um, that's on a rocky boat before you, you drop down there. Um, as I mentioned, raising awareness about the coral reef ecosystem. Um, we also include a bunch of species information in our maps and in our, in our resources. Um, and ultimately with the goal of encouraging conservation because again, uh, familiarity and, and education um, with marine, uh, you know, with and about marine ecosystems can only help the general public better understand when we have larger conversations about preserving and protecting um, these resources. So getting in a little bit more about um, you know, why and how, this is a, a fairly information rich um, type of, of uh, map that might exist, uh, hand-drawn. Your, your quality as a diver depends on the um, quality of the experience and the information depends on the, the artistic talents of your dive master uh, doing the briefing. Um, and so what we've looked to do is essentially convert the hand-drawn map into um, a photorealistic representation that provides all the same information and more. Um, how do we do it? It's essentially based, wrapped around CAD programs. It's, it's a modeling based process. Um, so you have this, which is an example of the Thunderdome in Turks and Caicos. And I don't know if you all are familiar with it, but it was a French game show that involved a steel cage that the diver was underneath without access to oxygen. And they had to 
complete tasks in order to have a regulator dangled between the grate to give them more air to go complete more tasks. It didn't last more than a season um, for very <laughs> obvious reasons. So, so how would we map that? What do we do? Well, we take, we don't use sonar. We don't use a lot of the data intensive programs. We just use a whole lot of pictures. We use videos. So we take a picture like this, um, take another picture, another picture, all these pictures to inform the layout from all the different angles, from all the different um, viewpoints that we can get to get sizes. We take measurements, we take depth sounding, and then we feed that into the modelers who create what is essentially, this is, you know, it looks pristine, but it's, the, it's a three-dimensional model. And we can manipulate that to choose any orientation that we feel best represents the reef, or we can offer two representations. And then once we do that, we expand the view, we add in um, key elements of the surrounding footprint, um, whether or not they're natural or artificial, um, we render it with um, environmental impacts, um, shadows to give it depth and give it um, a quality that makes you feel like it's actually a, a space rather than a, an image. Render it. And that's where the art comes in and art meets science. Um, obviously, there aren't individual coral and sponge heads exactly where each of those are. We can place key um, species and we can place key representations for formations that are particularly noteworthy. That's where the information comes in uh, from all these pictures. Um, you layer in a, the ocean surface and then you dial it back and voila, there's your site. Um, stripped of all any information, but it's essentially a representation that will allow a diver to go down and, and, and be able to visualize ahead of time what it is they're dropping down into. But it doesn't stop there because we can layer in a whole bunch of information. So you throw in the dive boat for perspective, there's the buoy, and there's some depth information. There's a proposed route. So as a diver, you not only are aware of what the environment will be below the water before you get in on the first time, but you also have the proposed route um, so that you have a better sense of how to plan your dive. Um, you throw in some orientation, a compass map, um, and, and you have a better sense of where this is based in terms of the wider geographic area. And you throw in some extra species, which are some key species, which aside from the, the uh, sessile ones, everyone understands that just because we drop in a grouper by the cage doesn't mean you're going to see a grouper by the cage. But then again, a lot of times groupers set up residency. And so you hear anecdotal stories from dive masters that there is a resident grouper in the wheelhouse of a such and such wreck. Well, this information um, is now readily available to the diver as they're going down, along with um, a visual cue for identification purposes. So some of our cards have greater behavioral information on what, as well, but um, in, this is something that we're developing. We're not fully all the way through all of our species, but we have online at our website, freely available and fairly regularly updated um, species information for all these key species that we have flagged on our cards. So someone can go and understand the predation, understand the distribution, understand that, um, you know, where they were diving off of North Carolina, it probably wasn't a Nassau grouper that they saw because they thought it was, but they came up and, you know, they've been able to match it up with the information that we have online. Um, so back to the card. So we can do these for um, something like the Thunderdome. We, we slap on our, our header. Um, this particular one has our own, um, our own logo and our own branding, um, but we can do branding with um, anything else, basically. We can, as you can see, that's just a layer on the card. So we can replace that with, um, you know, a lot of the dive operators at the dive resorts who have been our partners, uh, partnering with um, uh, non-commercial, non-for-profit um, to create cards that are fundraisers that have branding that support the the NGO or the governmental organization. Um, th there's a great deal of flexibility in this. Um, and so as I saw showed you with the model, given that it's a 3D environment that we can manipulate from all angles, zoom in and pivot, 
we can essentially set up any kind of render that we want that shows any perspective that we want. Um, it can be from above, it can be an aerial view. So we can do this with new wrecks. Um, we can do it with old wrecks like the Hilma Hooker in Bonaire. Um, we can even do it with shore-based objects. Um, this is Salt Pier in Bonaire for anyone who's had the good fortune of diving it. Um, and this is what I was talking about where we have some more uh, behavioral information along the bottom. We don't just list the six species. We've listed three species on this side and three on the other side and provided some longevity, max size and, and behavioral information for, uh, to enhance again, the experience of the divers. Um, we can do close-ups. As I said, this is all based on the same model. So it's just rendered at whatever resolution we want. You can zoom in essentially as much as you want um, or as little as you want. We can also do reefs. Um, so this is a reef uh, in, in Bonaire. It has the benefit of not being very deep. It's 16 to 19 feet. Obviously the, the challenges of mapping a bank reef that's about hundred feet down in really poor water visibility that might be a little harder to do, um, but we've, we've, uh, we've tackled some pretty deep reefs. Um, we've also done caverns. Caverns become a lot more art than science to some extent. And we are very clear that these should not be used as navigational aids, particularly when diving in caverns. Um, but at the same time, from the point of view of someone who is looking to understand what dives are possible in a region and, and what to expect from their dive, um, we feel that the, these do greatly enhance um, the experience. So, so how does all this work? Um, so we partner primarily with the diving industry, um, dive tour operators, or resorts, um, but we can be flexible. I mean, our model, as you can see, creates products that can be sold um, and that appeals in many ways to um, dive operators whom we tend to partner with because we also have to get out onto these reefs and they typically know which are the most popular sites. Um, ultimately, we cover the costs of our equipment. We cover the costs of our time, um, also all the product development, um, including the creation of 3D models, the graphic design work, and the, the actual printing and production of the materials. Um, and what we often end up, we don't charge a fee, but we look to our partners to help us offset our costs. Um, so ultimately, this is a, a partnership that tries to balance carrying everyone carrying the same risks and, and benefiting from the same rewards. And so while I um, mentioned that it's, it's generally focused on resorts and dive center operators and, and on-island partners, um, we're flexible in the ways that we work with partners. We're a relatively small company. Um, we, we have a, a clear desire to um, bring more of the ocean to people who are either actively experiencing it or may not be able to experience the ocean. And so um, our main interest is getting more of the uh, reefs and artificial reefs and wrecks and and other objects mapped and in people's hands um, and explained in an educational venue than simply um, sticking to a, um, a model that may or may not work for everyone. Um, so working with nonprofits and NGOs, uh, it's, it's not something we've done, um, but we're, we are open to that conversation and figuring out. Um, there are a lot of, specifically in the Keys, there are a lot of archeological sites um, that could really benefit from this kind of um, uh, mapping and 3D representation from an educational point of view um, and may not draw the same attention that the Okinawa does in Broward or some of the fresh wrecks that, that everyone loves to go dive because they're relatively well placed and they're very popular with, with um, a range of experienced divers. Um, so I guess I, I am here to A, from my point of view, make sure you guys know that we exist and that we've been operating in Broward um, and we hope to be back in, in Palm Beach in the, in the coming months. Um, but also to put it out there where as you all go back to, your, um, to the work that you're doing, be open to the concept that this kind of service, this kind of reality does exist. Um, it's not necessarily suitable for scientific purposes because the data resolution just isn't necessarily there. Um, but from the point of view of the uh, outreach and, and educational standpoint, 
Um, and in fact, bringing like what we like to say, putting the reefs and the wrecks in people's hands, like giving people the chance to hold in their hands and understand what it is that's going on under the water. Um, I think there's a lot of potential. So while I answer questions at the risk of having you all just stare at the screen, um, I'm going to run a small uh, video that's sped up of um, one of our modelers, I think making the Hydro Atlantic. Um, so feel free to ask questions or just stare blankly at the screen for the few minutes that we have left. Thank you, Peter. Are there any questions? 